invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to 36. We're going to kind of be camping out in this passage over the next three weeks. And you might think, I mean, why are we going to sit on four verses for three weeks? Um, it's because, actually, I did the series we're starting today. Um, the series is called The Awe and Mystery of God. And I originally did this series, I can't remember if it was two churches ago or the last church I was in, that I did this series on the awe and mystery of God. And uh, so it was meant to be f- four sermons that were about 20, 30 minutes long. And uh, because we want to have some time of discussion after the sermon, I've broken this sermon down into three parts. Um, so I'll be talking less and have more of a chance for us to discuss the passage together. And also, what God is teaching us through what we hear this morning. And also, talk together about how can we apply this to our lives today, too. Um, so that's why we'll be hanging out in this passage for the next three Sundays. Um, today, we're looking at the topic of God doesn't make sense. Hmm. We'll see what uh, we mean about that in a few moments here. Uh, we see things in life where sometimes God doesn't make sense in what he does. Have you ever had moments like that? I know I have. Lord, why is this happening? But God has the ultimate plan, and God's logic doesn't always apply to human logic um, because God has the best plan. Sometimes we go through situations, and we can look after, look back at it, going, oh, that does make sense now. I mean, I'll have liked what I've gone through still, but now it makes sense because I see how God is moving and working now. So that's where we're looking at this subject these next three Sundays. God doesn't make sense. He actually does make sense, but to human reason sometimes, it doesn't make sense sometimes. So again, Romans 11, verse 33 through 36. I'm actually going to ask, is there anyone here this morning who would like to read the passage for us this morning? Great. Because it's underlined in pink in my Bible. I know I like it. (laughs) Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, honey, for reading that for us this morning. Let's pray before we look at these words this morning. Lord God, we thank you so much for these words that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write to us. Lord, now as we look at these words, we ask you to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Douglas MacArthur reminisces with this thought and this story. This was back in the days before he was the general in uh, the U.S. Army. Here's what he writes. The first section was studying the time-space relationship, later formulated by Einstein as a theory of relativity. The text was complex, and being unable to comprehend it, I committed the pages to memory. When I was called upon to recite... I solemnly reeled off almost word for word what the book said. Our instructor, Colonel Furberger, looked at me somewhat, somewhat quizzically and asked, do you understand this theory? I don't know about you, but if I was in MacArthur, MacArthur's shoes at that point, I'd be kind of going, I'm a little bit nervous now, shaking in my boots a bit. It was a bad moment for me, he says, But I did not hesitate in replying, no, sir. You could have heard a pin drop. 
I braced myself and waited. And then the slow words of the professor, neither do I, Mr. MacArthur, section dismissed. <laughs> There's some things we don't understand sometimes, isn't there? Uh, some of these scientific theories that some of us can't comprehend, but also even further, that God created science. Now, let me give a clarification, because we'll be actually talking about creation in about four weeks from now. Um, because as we look at God, who created all things, part of the awe and mystery of who God is. But when we look at science, sometimes we get a little distorted view sometimes because of what man thinks is right, but is not right because of what God says in his word of what he did. Um, doesn't mean that we dismiss all the scientific theories, uh, because after all, God is the one who created this entire universe. He knows how it works together. But some of it sometimes when we look at it is like going, we don't understand how it works. Like the theory of relativity. <laughs> how do these things work? And even in our own lives, as I mentioned earlier, there's sometimes things that goes on that we're like going, we don't understand why God has allowed this to happen. Sometimes we have the question, why would, have you heard this phrase before? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Probably actually not a good phrase to say because, or a question to ask because when it comes down to it, there are no good people. That's why we needed the Savior to save us. Jesus is who makes us good. It's not our own actions. Um, our actions are good after we receive Christ as Lord and Savior. But still, we're not good people. But sometimes we have that question, Lord, why, why is this happening to me? I don't understand, Lord. Why is this happening to me? We, questions of like, why... Why would God allow a child to die before their parents? Now, we've experienced that in our family many years ago. Uh, maybe you've experienced that. Or maybe it's a loss of job. Lord, why would you allow my job to be ended? You know I need to provide for my family, for my household, or for myself. Or, Lord, why would you move people from here to there? Move people out of our lives. Why would you allow this or that to happen? We just don't understand sometimes, do we? Sometimes it's difficult. So that's why it's important for us to explore this subject this morning and this next couple of Sundays, how God doesn't make sense. As we'll see through these next three Sundays, that God does make sense, though. Even though we may not like what we go through, God always has the perfect plan for us. As we look through history, too, I remember when I was in seminary, maybe it was Bible college, it was Bible college. I was studying about hi Israel a little bit. And reading th one of the pr classes I had was a survey of the Old Testament. And part of that class was you had to read through the entire New Test Old Testament sorry, within four months. And as we did that, I kept on reading about Israel. And many time, time after time again, how Israel would follow God, then they'd sin. And then God would put them into captivity because they were disobedient to God. Then they repent, and then God would free them. They'd be back in their no native land again. And then what would happen again? They'd blew it again, right? They'd sin and worship some other idols then. Then God would discipline them. They'd be brought into captivity again. They'd repent. God would bring them back to their homeland again. What would happen again? Same thing all over again. We see that time and time again throughout the Old Testament, don't we? And yet, Lord, why would you choose Israel who would rebel so many times against you? Choose them to be your chosen people. And then I remember thinking after I was reading those passages, thinking about my own self. Lord, <laughs> how was it that you would still call me to relationship with you? Knowing that even as a Christian that there'd be times I'd fall in sin still. How many times you'd have to cry to me to get me in right relationship with him again? Not that I need to be saved again. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, that moment of salvation, we're saved then. But as we said earlier, there's times where we fall short sometimes in sin. And to me, it just doesn't make sense. Why would God still choose to save me, knowing what I would still do in the future? Doesn't make sense, does it? But I'm so glad that God is God and I am not. Because <laughs> even I wouldn't make it to heaven. Not saying that I'm better than anyone else, because I know I'm not. There's others that I would think are better than me. But it shows that, that God has something amazing planned.
that God has a reason for allowing things to happen that we may not understand. <coughs> there's one point I want to share with you this morning, and there's a couple sub points to this. So, son, if you can move to the next one. Actually, if you go back to one slide a minute again, sorry about that. Th- this phrase, this sentence here is kind of the, the theme throughout this whole series of the awe and mystery of God. And so here's what it says. Everyone should be in awe of God because he does not make sense. Well, the last part of that sentence has to do with these th- three Sundays. But the whole point of this whole series is t- to be in the awe and mystery of God. Next slide, son. So the first thing we see here this morning is we can be in awe of the depth, the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. God has so much wisdom and knowledge, we can't fathom it all. So I had a conversation with someone yesterday about that very thing. How when we have God's word, it's all that God wants us to know and understand about him, about salvation, and the future, and about heaven, about what we're being saved from, our sins and eternity in hell. And sometimes we have some questions that there seems to be some other things going on that God doesn't cover in his word. But I said this, that if God wanted us to know it, it'd be in his word. So, for instance, spiritual warfare. There's some things that we see in God's word that teaches us, but there seem to be some things in spiritual warfare still that God's word doesn't cover that we don't understand or know. And I believe that's because God doesn't want us to know it because it's not that important for us. Besides, if we knew some of those things, maybe we'd be freaked out too much. <laughs> or maybe we rely on our power instead of God's power in dealing with some of these things. Because we're supposed to be dependent, fully dependent upon God. So the n- we need to be in the awe of the depth of God's wisdom and knowledge. Verse 33 of our passage this morning says this, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. It speaks about how his ways are above our ways, right? Elsewhere in God's word it says those words, that his ways are above our ways. God has so much knowledge. He knows the past. He knows the present. He knows the future. He knows all things. One of the big theological words we have for this is that God is omnipotent. That means he knows all things. There are some who teach, though, in, the, in some churches that, well, God only has some knowledge. Oh, they're wrong. <laughs> God has all knowledge of all things. He knows the future. There's a song that has the words to that very thing, that I know who holds the future. It is God who holds the future. He knows all things. That's why when we ask the question, Lord, why is this happening? We can rest the insurance that God knows what's coming next. And what he's doing now is for his glory and for our good. That he's going to use to bring honor and glory to him even more and to draw us closer to him. The word unsearchable here in verse 33 is the Greek word anexruinatas. It's a hard word to say, isn't it? We'll try saying that again. Anexruinatas. (laughs) Runectos, <laughs> or the toss, something like that. Uh, anyway, this Greek word here means that cannot be searched out. Something that cannot be searched. Have you ever lost something and you couldn't find it? You searched high and low throughout your house, maybe in your vehicle because you're looking for your keys, and you can't find it? There's sometimes it's happened to me, and then when I've taken time to stop and pray then, it's like all of a sudden God points me right in the right direction to go to find my keys. Now, sometimes it's the f- goofiest, silly thing is that the keys are right in my hand sometimes. <laughs> you are doing that too? Where do my keys go when they're right in your hand? Where do my glasses go when they're on top of your head? <laughs> There's times, though, when maybe they're not in our hands or on our head, and we can't find those things, but we pray, and God directs us to where those things are. We didn't know where they were, but God knew where they were. 
I remember talking about that with my kids sometimes too. They remember sometimes they couldn't find something in the house. And so sometimes Sherry or I have said to them, have you prayed about that? And whenever they prayed about it, a short time after, they were able to find what they were searching for. Things, though, of God are unsearchable. We, they cannot be found, unlike a set of keys or a pair of glasses. There are some things of God that are found of fathomable, but again, when God doesn't make sense, those are some things that are unfathomable, things that we cannot search out or know because God has ultimate knowledge. The Amplified Version uses the word unfathomable instead of unsearchable. How about thinking about that word, unfathomable? Have you ever contemplated nothing? <laughs> I've done that a couple of times too. When, people th- when we see in God's Word and talks about how God created the whole universe by speaking into existence. He had no material, no matter. And yet, God spoke everything into existence. Before God spoke everything into existence, there was nothing, literally nothing. There was no universe. There was no earth. There was no plants. There was no people. Fathom that for a moment. Can you fathom that? Nothingness? No. We can't, we can't gra- grab a reminder on that, can we? And there's just some truths about God that are unfathomable. Doesn't mean we can't know some things about God. We can because we have His Word. But there's some things that are just unfathomable because God has ultimate knowledge of all things. There's three truths to this. First one is A wisdom belongs to Him. That's ultimate wisdom again, belongs to God. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Daniel's in the Old Testament. If you come across Isaiah or Jeremiah, keep on going back further in the New Test- or Old Testament, you're, all, you're almost there. Daniel is actually the first, I can't remember if they classified it as the major prophet or minor prophet. Um, I think it's a minor prophet. And if it is, it's the first of the minor prophets. Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. And it says this. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. Just so you know, this verse, when Daniel's speaking here, it comes in the context of Daniel revealing a dream to Nebuchadnezzar and the meaning of it. And Daniel's given praise to God and saying that God has ultimate knowledge in this. God is who will reveal what has taken place in this dream, what this dream means. So again, that means the truth that God has all wisdom, that wisdom belongs to Him. Then B, second truth here is that God's wisdom is practical. Turn with me to Ezra. It's earlier on in the Old Testament. Come across Nehemiah, it's right before Nehemiah. And I flipped too far myself. It's after Second Cr- Chronicles, if you come across Second Chronicles. Ezra chapter seven, verse twenty five. And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river. All such as, all such has no, sorry, let me try that again. (laughs) All such as know the laws of your God and those who do not know them you shall teach. This verse is speaking to speaking to how how God's wisdom is practical. 
As we go through his word, we see oftentimes that God gives his practical wisdom to his people. And here's one where it talks about how to handle these certain situations that Ezra, that Ezra was having to deal with. Wisdom in teaching and, and judging. You might remember another passage too when, when Moses is leading Israel out, of, uh, Israel out of Egypt. And as he leads them out into the wilderness, they come across his father-in-law. Uh, I forgot his name all of a sudden for some reason. Jethro, there we go. Thank you, honey. And Jethro has seen something taking place in, the, in Israel too, where Moses was worrying himself out because he was judging every single situation going on in the nation of Israel. And God gave some wisdom to Jethro to give to Moses, saying, hey, Moses, this isn't good. You're going to burn yourself out. I'm paraphrasing right now, okay? <laughs> this is good for you. You're going to burn yourself out. So what you should need to do is put people, have people as judges that you trust to be over thousands, over tens of thousands, over hundreds, and over even smaller amounts. And then when they're a big issue, have them come to you. But all the other smaller issues, pass on to these other people so you don't burn out. Now that's good wisdom, isn't it? God's given us that wisdom for the church too, right? God has given each person in the church spiritual gifts that we can use to do the work God has called us to do together. That way, no one in the church burns out. So God has practical wisdom that he gives to us too. Some of his practical wisdom, though, doesn't make sense still sometimes. Think of many other stories in the Old Testament. Remember the story of Elisha and Naaman? Naaman was a commander of an army of a, a nation that was actually opposed to Israel, but yet he had heard about, uh, about Elisha and the power that God had in him. It's actually a servant girl, girl to name Nahum. And she told him, and so he went to find Elisha. He brought all riches along with him and said, Elisha, I've heard that you can heal, and so here's all these riches. I want you to heal me. Well, Elisha wasn't really concerned about these riches. He said, what I want you to do is go to the River Jordan and dunk yourself seven times. Because Naaman had a really bad disease called leprosy. If you don't know much about leprosy, it's an awful disease where you lose feeling in your body, and so things happen, like, for instance, touching a hot surface, you'll burn yourself and not know that you've burnt yourself. So sometimes people's appearance become very marred because of accidents that happen because they've lost that sense of feeling. But Naaman, though, said, well, why should I wash in the River Jordan? It's a dirty, dirty river. I could go back home and there's a lot cleaner bodies of water that I can go and wash in. But Elisha said, no, go to the River Jordan. You might remember that as he dunks six times, he looks at his body each time and sees the, all the spots are still on him. But on the seventh time, he dunks down and comes up, and the spots are all clear. God gave his wisdom to Elisha, even though it didn't make sense. But good thing that Naaman obeyed because he was healed. Does it make sense to wash in dirty water? No. Have you ever washed dir dirty dishes in dirty water? Oily water? Plates don't get clean, do they? But in essence, I would, that's what God told Elisha to tell Naaman to do. Or how about when Jesus spit in the eye of a blind man? How would you like that for, for healing? <laughs> Having someone spit in your eye if you're blind to be healed. And yet that's what Jesus did. Didn't make sense, but that man was healed. Or, or the story of Israel walking around Jericho. They were told each day to walk around Jericho one time and on the seventh day to walk around seven times and on the seventh time to blow their horns and give it a loud shout. Who wins battles by marching around a city? Could you imagine if we did that in World War II? Marched around cities, around nations instead of bombing <laughs> and having soldiers fight? Wouldn't make sense, would it? But that's what God told Israel to do. And on the seventh day, after the seventh time around, the walls of Jericho fell. And they were able to go up and into Jericho and defeat Jericho. 
I'm sure there have been some Israelites that must have questioned. Moses, why would we, or Joshua, why would we march around Jericho? Makes no sense. Who fights battles like that? But yet, in God's wisdom, is the practical thing to do. One more personal example, Gideon. God also told Gideon, get the army of Israel, and I want you to stand around your enemy's camp. What I want you to do to fight this battle was to rattle your pitchers, break these pitchers, and blow your horns. Not only that, when we first, when the army of Israel first left the camp, they marched out, and God said, I want you, Joshua, to weed out some of the army. So anyone who is afraid, you weed them out and saying, all those who are afraid for this battle, go home. They come across a brook, a, a river, and God says, Joshua, the army is still too big. So what I want you to do then is tell your men to drink. And those who lap up the water like a dog, send them home. Everyone else, continue on. The army was whittled down from tens of thousands to just a few thousand. Did that make sense? To fight a battle against another city, uh, against another army that was far massive than them? Or even to rattle these pictures and to break them and just blow their horns? No. And yet, God won the battle for Israel. It caused such chaos that their enemies ended up killing themselves and each other instead. God's wisdom, even though it doesn't make sense to us sometimes, is the best wisdom because he has practical knowledge that he wants us to do. And then see, he gives his wisdom. Turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. It's good to know that God will give us his wisdom if we ask of it. Again, it may not make sense to us sometimes, but God is willing to give us his wisdom in every situation. I'll give you a short story with this uh, from my own life. I remember I was a youth pastor in, in Winnipeg, pastoring a, a youth group. And uh, it was in a time frame we had, we had actually just lost our daughter about a month before. Our daughter had passed away. And I remember, though, our pastor had resigned. It was his last board meeting with the board. Uh, he still had another month of ministry with the church, but that church... Once you resign as a pastor, they say you can't come to leadership meetings anymore. So he had about a month left. But I remember this meeting because after it, the pastor, his wife, and I were walking out of the church and walking down the stairs outside the church. And as we're walking down the stairs, God says to me, the board is asking you, is talking about asking you to leave. Kind of shocked me. So I started talking to the pastor with, about that and I said, you know, they're actually in there talking about asking me to leave right now. And he said, no, 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 they're, they're just talking about our Christmas bonuses. That's, that's all they're talking about. And besides, if, if they're going to try to get you to leave, they're just going to make it hard for you to leave and s make it hard for you so you'll want to leave instead. Well, a couple of days went by and I asked the Lord, Lord, why did you say to me on the way out the door that they're going to ask me to leave? doesn't make sense to me. And God said to me, because I want you to learn grace. Great, Lord. I'm glad that you want me to learn grace. Now you told me, can we just skip the hard part now, though? <laughs> can we just skip to the good part? <laughs> no, God said, no. I want you to learn grace. To make a long story shorter, remember the last day I was to be the youth pastor of the church. The moderator had met with me before to, uh, saying, we, 
that they wanted me to leave. And that Sunday, I came across him in the hallway. And I just had the sense that God was saying to me, ask, I can't remember his name right now. Kurt, I remember his name now. Ask Kurt how he's doing. It was a moment that God wanted me to show grace to him. So I asked him, Kurt, how, how are you this morning? His response was he did, wasn't doing too well. He didn't feel good about what was taking place that day. So I prayed for him. My normal gut reaction would be like going, I don't want to talk to anyone that I don't have to today. But God wanted me to show grace. And in particular, this is one person. I don't know where he stood on the situation, but I could tell he had a heavy heart. I kind of wonder today, I have, don't know what the answer is to this, but I wonder how by God did want me to learn grace affected Kurt that day? Did he see more of God's grace that day because I took the time to ask him how he was doing and then to pray for him? That whole situation doesn't make sense to me. But yet God had ultimate wisdom in that. I had to listen to his wisdom in the situation. God does, God, does God make sense? Sometimes he doesn't. But again, he has ultimate wisdom to know what is best to do. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are a God that even though sometimes we don't understand and you don't make sense to us, you have ultimate wisdom and knowledge. We're so thankful, Lord God, that you know all things, even including things yet to come. Lord, even told us about some of those things in your word about future things that are to take place yet. There are many other details where we don't know what is going to happen in the future still, but you do know. So Lord, thank you that we can rest assured knowing that you have the best plan even when you allow us to go through things that don't make sense to us. Because you know, God, you are good.